Listen to the vibes hosted by Coyote Night. Listen in for some positivity and good times. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. I have here Mr. Jeff Hatch, who is an actor in a little film called The Crumbs. How are you today, sir? I'm doing good, Kyle. Thanks for having me. All right, so just start off with hear about you. We want everybody needs to know more about the Jeff Hatch, <laughs> the one and only. Uh, I'm uh, well. I, I'm. I don't consider myself. Uh, uh, well, I, I obviously I consider myself a professional actor, uh, but I don't consider myself a career actor. I, I consider myself uh, more of a uh for lack of a better word uh, uh, like a like a paid hobbyist uh <laughs> as an actor i i'm not uh you won't see me in all you won't uh check out my imdb page and and see a hundred you know shows uh, or or titles that you recognize like you know uh, a bunch of actors you'll click on their imdb and you'll see oh, oh he's done a he did a shot he did a role in uh you know, CSI or Grey's Anatomy or, oh, he was, uh, you know, he was on an episode of uh, this or that, uh, that you really, oh, he, was, he, did, he did a couple episodes on Walking Dead, you know, okay, cool. Uh, did do an episode of The Office when that was on the air uh, in its last season. Uh, I also did several episodes of the soap opera Days of Our Lives and that's what kind of kicked me off into the uh, professional acting world to begin with. Um, but I just, uh, I, I didn't get a lot of traction with my acting career uh, in terms of, you know, just being able to get it to, to snowball, to grow. Uh, I got a few little commercials, like little uh, local and uh, like uh, cable television channel commercials, uh, internet commercials and uh and that's been about it uh every time i get the opportunity to act uh and get paid for it i will jump at it uh but i'm i'm not uh i'm not spending a lot of time going after just any acting work um i when i submit myself for acting roles uh, i'm i'm only submitting myself for roles that interest me uh, I'm only submitting myself for roles that look like, you know, they'll, they'll showcase my abilities as an actor. And so uh, since I'm not going for bit parts or, or for, uh, and I don't have enough uh, uh, exposure uh, to get into uh, some of the bigger agencies that might be able to move me up the ladder and get me into the, like the primetime television shows and whatnot. Um, you know, I just haven't uh, pursued that career path that a lot of actors do. You know, they sacrifice a lot of time. They sacrifice a lot of uh, just a, a lot of effort and capital uh, to move their way up the ladder in the acting world. And uh, I just never wanted to do that. And it's a lot of effort uh, for a very small reward for many, many, many years. At, all in the hopes that you might possibly make it to the point where you're making a really nice living as an actor one day. Right. And uh, uh, so I just didn't have the ambition to, to pursue that track. Uh, but God bless the actors who do. And, and believe me, I would jump at it if I got the opportunity to be in, you know, any, any kind of a high profile project or, or a project with, you know, any higher profile than, than the stuff that I've done. Uh, that actually, I, I have done one or two things. Uh, like I said, The Office and The, uh, uh, the Days of Our Lives show. I, I was also, a, had a pretty decent supporting role in a project from the same studio that did the Sharknado movies. Uh, they're called The Asylum. And I was in a, I was in a movie that they they did. Uh, it was another really 
is one of those B movies, uh, but it wound up uh, getting on uh, the Sci-Fi Channel, mm -hmm. and it's another monster shark movie, uh, and it's uh, it's called Mega Shark versus Colossus, uh, which is you know as good as it sounds. Uh, it, it's uh, it's about a giant shark fighting a giant robot. So. <laughs> Hey, you know, uh, those it, movies got pretty popular. So. Yeah, they did. Uh, all of those, all of those sort of uh, uh, just schlocky B movies that, that were made just because they're fun. They're so, they're so good. They're bad type thing, uh, or they're so bad. They're good type thing. Uh, a lot of those, you know, wind up becoming, you know, little sleeper hits like the Sharknado movies mm -hmm. have become. And uh, the Asylum is known for turning out movies like that. And they use, you know, uh, some A-list and B-list actors in their role, in their in their lead roles. Um, hey, well, and, brought back uh, Ian Ziering, so. Yeah, Ian Ziering and uh, I, I think Tara Reid was in uh, one of those and a uh, whole bunch of whole bunch of names that, you know, uh, I can't even go into because they're, they're not jumping right to mind, but uh, Ileana Douglas was, uh, was a, was a pretty well-renowned actor, actress back in the nineties. And she was in the movie that I did the, the mega shark versus Colossus. She had the lead role in that, and I played uh, sort of a, a, a kind of an antagonist to her, sort of her foil. And uh, uh, it was it was a, a stupid movie, but you know some of the scenes actually came off really well. Uh, they were really fun, and uh, actually, uh, you know, it, it did get some exposure for me as an actor because it wound up on the sci-fi channel they play it uh on shark week you know every time uh every time shark week comes up on uh, national geographic channel the uh the sci-fi channel uh runs a bunch of like monster shark movies right uh, like uh you know three-headed giant shark uh you know uh <laughs> sharknado and and sharktopus and uh mega shark versus this and that they got four of those mega shark movies i was in the fourth one uh but anyway that's that's a little bit about my career uh as an actor as a professional actor uh it's it's been you know i came to to hollywood when i was in my mid-20s mm -hmm. uh and you know i just i just wanted to be an actor i just wanted to be uh you know, uh, make a living. And, and of course I had dreams like, you know, winning the Oscar, you know, taking home an Emmy and uh, all those things that, that most actors, hey. you know, envision themselves doing. I got a Dundee. Nice. <laughs> you talked about the office. I got a Dundee. <laughs> I don't even have a Dundee. Uh, that's yeah. If you uh, if you watch that show, uh, I'm in the ninth episode of the last season. Uh, I'm a limo driver, and okay. uh, I actually got that that episode because I am a limo driver. It's that's my day job, uh, and I have the uh, I have the commercial passenger endorsement on my license. Uh, so that I could drive the stretch limos and they wanted somebody for that role who actually could drive the stretch uh, on camera. And what's funny is they didn't even use the uh, the shot of the limo driving through town. Uh, they just kind of, they had a, a two and a half second shot of the limo pulling up to the curb and then they cut to the inside of the limo. I, I exchanged a couple of lines with Jim uh john krasinski's character and uh that was it that was my that was my uh that was my big moment on on the office um that would have been you, enough you, for me yeah yeah <laughs> and uh maybe i maybe i could have earned a dundee but nobody you know my, my agent didn't lobby for it so uh, you know i'll tell you what we'll we'll hook you up with the dundee how's that <laughs> <laughs> nice 
So where are you from originally? Uh, born and raised in San Diego. Okay. San Diego County. Uh, grew up down there uh, through high school. Uh, and then I moved around quite a lot. Actually, my family always moved around a lot. Uh, my dad was a truck driver. My mom was a, a teacher. Before she was a teacher, she was uh, just doing odd jobs like, uh, you know, cleaning houses, uh, janitor for a church, uh, a few other things. And uh, my dad was a trucker, so he was out uh, cross country sometimes up to six months out of the year. He'd be gone, you know, for two, three weeks at a time, home for two week, two or three weeks at a time. And, uh, and we kind of had a nomadic existence because they were always, they would rent a house and we would stay there for a year or two. The, the, uh, the owners of the house would sell it and we'd wind up moving uh, to some other house, usually tried to stay in the same town. So we would move, you know, across town or a few blocks away. Yeah. And uh, we probably occupied 15 different houses uh, from the time I really started having cognizant memories, <laughs> like five years old or whatever, until the time I graduated high school. I think uh, I moved around with my family to, to you know, 12 or 15 different houses uh, that we lived in uh, all around San Diego County, mostly in the same area. Uh, and then, uh, you know, moved out. Uh, I lived in uh, Phoenix, Arizona for a couple of years. Okay. Uh, while I was there, I, was, uh, I moved up to Phoenix uh, to take care of my grandmother who was sick and uh, she passed away while I was living there. Mm. Uh, but I was just taking care of her and taking care of her property, taking care of her house and trying to get it ready to, to get sold so that we could move her into a, a care facility and whatnot. Uh, but she wound up passing away before any of that happened. Uh, and I stayed on until that property sold. So I was in Phoenix, Arizona for a good two and a half years. And while I was there, uh, I decided I had always wanted to learn karate. Mm. And uh, I got into this dojo in Phoenix, Arizona, where I started taking classes. And uh, I got into a program that that dojo offered, which was a, a fast track program to become a teacher. Uh, so I became an assistant instructor at that dojo after about a year of constant classes. This is, this is uh, uh, like I said, kind of a fast track program. So uh, instead of taking two or three classes a week uh, in, and, and it eventually after a year or two or three, you could earn a black belt. I was taking seven or eight classes a week, plus, you know, working at the dojo, you know, doing whatever odd jobs, you know, cleaning, maintenance, uh, helping build and tear down things and whatnot. Uh, it was, uh, was kind of like, uh, you know, karate kid, wax on, wax off, you know, paint the fence and you know, do all these chores for, for the, for the sensei. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, every day I'm in there, you know, doing, you know, just constantly learning and, uh, and, uh, growing as a martial artist. And, uh, eventually I became a, uh, a, a, an assistant instructor there, got my black belt. Uh, and then, uh, moved back to California. Uh, and uh, then I started going to school to take acting lessons. Uh, I, at that point, I decided I had always done, uh, I had always done uh, high school theater. I had always done uh, community theater stuff. Uh, and I, I always had it in the back of my mind that that's something that I would like to try to pursue. So when my grandmother's house in Phoenix finally sold, uh, it was my opportunity to move back. And so I moved back to California, uh, 
started taking theater and, and uh, film acting lessons at, at some uh, community colleges. Uh, eventually I got into a program at one school that had a, a three year uh, uh, what's the, oh, the word. <laughs> it, it was called the Los Angeles Theater Academy at Los Angeles City College. And uh, it was a three year program uh, that was just focused on uh, theater in all aspects, technical theater, as well as uh, acting, writing, directing, uh, the whole shebang. It kind of covers the entire uh, the entire sphere of anything that you can do in, in theater as a career. Uh, but I focused on the acting part and uh, I was there for three years learning my craft and uh, and then I got out and I started uh, just trying to make a living and keeping ends meet, uh, keeping the ends meeting. And, uh, you know, eventually I got, you know, a few little gigs here and there acting uh, in uh, well, if you look at my IMDb res uh, credits again, you'll see uh, I did like a bunch of these little cable shows that were reenactment uh, programs uh, where, you know, they'll they'll have uh, interviews with uh, people who do who were involved in uh, some investigation, like a criminal investigation. A couple of them were like paranormal investigations. And uh, they would do the interview with the people who actually uh, participated in those things. And then they'll cut to a, a dramatized reenactment of, and you see these shows all over the place on, uh, on cable channels, these reenactment shows. And uh, I did a few of those. I did a handful of those. Um, then I got the, uh, the Days of Our Lives gig. Uh, yeah, I got a, a few little indie films, short films, student films, and that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, eventually I cobbled together uh, enough footage to, uh, to put, you know, a decent looking reel together that looks like, you know, okay, here's a guy who, who has at least been on camera. He's done some good work. And, uh, you know, it looks like he knows how to act. And uh, so I started sending that reel around and I've added to it bit by bit over the years and subtracted from it stuff that doesn't really work for me anymore. And, uh, you know, then, and that is, that's exactly how I wound up getting uh, roles in things like the crumbs uh, working with Craig and David, you know, I sent them, I submitted myself for their, for their project. I sent them the reel uh, that I had put together. Uh, they saw, you know, the work that I had done and thought, okay, this guy looks all right. He could, he, he, could, he could maybe carry this part. And they uh, sent me an invitation to audition for them. And, you know, as far as the crumbs is concerned anyway, the rest is history. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Smith. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's us. Please come in. See this man? How did you folks come to eat me flesh? Do you like them? The next town is 32 miles that way. We don't get too many visitors out here unless they're lost. They were lost. And now they're found. <laughs> you little bastard. Oh my gosh, this is so good. I want this done immediately. She cannot stay in Lennon. <laughs> Face. I'm aging again. So if I took it now, I'd stay like this. I can prep him if you'd like. I know that that won't be necessary. Yeah, prep me. Turn here. You got quite the setup here. So where did you draw your inspiration for the character? Uh, you know, somebody else asked me that once, and uh, the the interesting thing is that there's usually I when I get into a role, I envision that role 
uh, by trying to channel uh, e either a performance from another actor that I've seen, like this role reminds me of, oh, you know, the Kaiser Soze, or, or this, this role kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, the, the, like, there was a role that I played uh, a few years ago uh, before The Crumbs uh, in a movie called Black Mark. And mm -hmm. when I read the role, I kind of, I, I said to myself, you know, this kind of reminds me of, of um, just the way the dialogue was written and the way the, uh, uh, the, the type of character he was reminded me of Edward James Almost's character in Battlestar Galactica. He played Commander Adama in that series. And, uh, and it kind of reminded me of that character. And so I kind of tried to channel that vibe into what I was doing with my character. And in another role that I, that I had an amazing amount of, uh, of fun with, it was, uh, there's a movie called Borderland that I was in. And, uh, I got to share some screen time with uh, Peter Fonda in that movie. And also uh, I got to work with Bruce Dern. I was gonna ask you about film. that. Yeah, and uh, I, that, was, that was an amazing time on set. Uh, I had a great role and uh, that role, I had just seen this documentary about uh, a, uh, a murderer. Uh, mm -hmm named Richard Kuklinski. Uh, he was a guy that, uh, he, was a, he was a mob enforcer and he was just a cold-blooded killer. And uh, they did a documentary on him called The Iceman, something about Iceman. There's a movie called The Iceman starring um, uh, Michael Shannon. And uh, Michael Shannon plays Richard Kuklinski in that film, The Iceman. But in the documentary, they actually talk to the guy in jail. They interview him. And this guy was so cold, just a straight up sociopath. And, and I was fascinated by him. So when I, when I played this character that I did in Borderland, uh, I, I tried to channel that guy, this Richard Kuklinski guy. Oh, uh, so in, in those two instances, uh, I had a very clear vision of, uh, or a very clear idea of, of how I wanted my character to, to sound, to look, and how I wanted him to act and behave. Uh, you know, just from having that idea of channeling other people into the role that I was playing. Um, when it comes to Dr. Crumb, uh, I didn't really have any, I, I didn't lock on to any other performances or any, uh, any other type of personalities. I just, I just kind of played him instinctively. Um, like the, 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 uh, the use of the British accent actually came instinctively uh, when I auditioned for the role. Uh, he wasn't written as a British character. He was written just, they, they had originally just written the, the, uh, the family as just American. They, they didn't have a, uh, uh, anything in their vision about them being British, but uh, when I auditioned, I, I just instinctively decided I would do a British accent with the character in, and they asked for two takes. They said, give us two takes, give us, and, and do something different with each take. So the first take I did in a British accent, the second take I did in the American accent. And when I got the call uh, for the role, uh, when I got the call telling me that I had the job, uh, David and Craig told me that uh, what I did with the accent inspired them to change the characters to, uh, to, to be like, oh, hey, if all of our actors that are playing, you know, the family members of the crumbs have the ability to, to do 
uh, the British accent, we could use that uh, so that instead of having to spell it out for the audience in the dialogue, we can just have them change accents when they're in front of different people, when they're among themselves and they're just talking as themselves, you know, we find out that they're actually British, but when they're in front of their guests, when they're in front of their, uh, uh, or other strangers, you know, they, they pick up this American accents and, uh, and that's supposed to just help clue the audience in that we're not really who we say we are and that we're actually from somewhere very different than we say we are because we go around telling everybody uh, that comes around, oh, where are you from? Oh, we've, we've lived here all our lives. We grew up in this valley. We've, we've run this bed and breakfast for 50 years or whatever, right. uh, you know, and, uh, but then when nobody's around, all of a sudden we're talking like this and we're, you know, <laughs> uh, we're, we're not at all who they thought we were. And so the fact that I brought that to the table uh, from the beginning at my audition uh, had an effect on uh, the way they, they decided to tell the story, which uh, I thought was pretty cool that, you know, I was, I was instrumental in, in, in making that, you know, part of the story, uh, you know, kind of come to life yeah, for, yeah, the, yeah. for the directors. But uh, at yeah. any rate, uh, but in terms of, of like how I envisioned the character, I just, you know, I just kind of played it instinctively. I just, I just kind of rolled with it. The, uh, the writing and the script, uh, partially because David, his writing style is really loose. Uh, it, it's not concrete. He doesn't, he doesn't expect the actors to, to, you know, stick to the every jot and tittle of right. every line in the script, although some actors do. Uh, but he allowed me to really ad lib a lot with the role. Uh, and especially because I brought the uh, British accent into it, uh, I wanted to I wanted to play with the lines and make them sound more British, especially when he was speaking just amongst his family. I, I wanted to uh, kind of rephrase a lot of things uh, simply because even though what I was saying as a character is exactly what you know the writer wanted me to say, I was still telling the exact same story, but I was just rephrasing things, you know, in a, in a, in a more upper crusty British sort of a way. Yeah. Kind of that, that character just made me think, Oh, he's so proper, you know, but he's so sadistic at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. and it gave I don't know, the movie kind of gave me that uh, Rob zombie kind of movie feel. Yeah, I like that comparison too because I see that uh, it, it does have kind of a Rob Zombie vibe uh, a bit, yeah. uh, and there's you know there's there's elements of of so many other things happening in that film because uh, you've seen the 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 like cannibal crazy family that that preys on innocent passersby in other movies. You know they they've done. A, a, a family or a clan uh, that that victimizes uh, strangers, like in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm -hmm. The Hills Have Eyes, uh, Wrong Turn, those type of movies. Uh, so you've seen that before, but in those movies, the the families are just batshit crazy you know they're you know they're chasing you through the forest with a chainsaw and an axe and a mm -hmm. you know hacksaws and whatever else and and you know crossbows and uh, <laughs> exactly and a mace and you know so you have just a lot of screaming and running through the desert so screaming and running through the forest screaming and running through the swamp, whatever it is. Uh, and, you know, people getting hacked to bits by these crazy people. And so you really have zero empathy for the family 
for the clan, for the for the people that are doing the the uh, sinister, nasty deeds. But in the crumbs, they kind of turn that on its head, and they make the uh, they make the family sympathetic and interesting, and quirky and fun, and you kind of you kind of like these people a little bit, and you you're you're brought into their world so you kind of understand what they do and why they do it uh it's not just you know some crazy insane people that just want blood right, uh, right. and you know so and the other elements that they kind of brought into it were was the kind of frankenstein mad scientist elements and you know a, along with like a vampire or Dorian Gray uh, immortality element. Right. Um, so you have all of these different things working together uh, to create a really unique set of characters. Yeah, I, I love the way that uh, David wrote that, that story. Um, and, and David, it's really an amazing actor himself. Yeah. Of course, I, I call him uh, Father Bob, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I really liked about David's uh, directing is that he's not just a director, he's a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and so every, every take on set, you know, every, every time we were between takes, he's giving acting lessons uh he's not just giving direction you know he's, he's he's giving lessons and uh so it was really fun to learn from him because he really is a master of his craft and he's passing that along to uh the actors that he's working with on set right. and uh and he really got some some great performances out of you know out of everybody especially uh those actors who had less experience on camera uh he really uh he really got the most out of everybody um you know i'm thinking especially of anton uh anton clark who plays leonard mm -hmm. uh young guy uh pretty new to the acting world pretty new to the to the whole you know acting game and uh you know he has a great instinctive talent uh yeah. as, as anton and uh he was i mean it's in his blood you can see it uh oh yeah the way he is on camera the way he performed uh, in that character uh he was terrific uh, to work with and you know david really took him under his wing and and uh and you know got just all kinds of great nuance out of his performance that, uh, you know, I, I don't know if Anton knew that he had it in him, but, uh, and I don't know that another director would have gotten it out of him. I, I don't know that, you know, a, a direct, because this film, you know, it was shot quick and dirty. Yeah. It was shot on a real low budget and we had a real short window of time to get everything done. Uh, so it's a real testament to, uh, the ability and the skill of of the director and the writers and the the, the uh, producers and the the whole crew uh, to have gotten that movie done in I, I think we were I think we had a total of thirteen shoot days that we did that movie in I think we were actually in town for sixteen calendar days. But mm -hmm. three of those were days off. Um, three of those were Sundays. So we took Sundays off and uh, the rest of the time, 16 days uh, or, or 13 shoot days. And uh, we got it all done. And in spite of weather uh, uh, problems on the first week, I think like the first five of those shoot 13 shooting days, we had rain. Really? Yeah, that would that would come down intermittently and it would come down hard and so we couldn't shoot outside so we'd move inside to shoot some of the interior stuff 
uh, just so that we didn't lose time. So we'd go in and try to shoot some of the interior stuff and, and that cabin that we were shooting in had a, uh, had a tin roof. Oh, that'd be fun. And so the rain pouring down on that tin roof was making way too much noise for us <laughs> to be able to use the shots. So, right. you know, we lost so much time. Uh, and, you know, we had to keep pushing things off to the next day, pushing things off to the next day. And uh, we wound up like getting like half the shots that we wanted to get on the, those first five days of shooting. And then we had to make up all those shots uh, in the rest of the very short window of time that we had left and we got it done. And uh, not only did we get it done, they were able to, we got it done well enough that they were, they were able to put it together in post and, you know, stitch it together and, uh, and really make it work. I was, I was really pleasantly surprised with, with how well this movie turned out uh, in the final product. Well, it's amazing is they had a, they have a gruesome movie here without being gory. Yeah. Yeah, you I know, mean, there's definitely some, on. there are definitely some gruesome, and I like that word that you, that you chose. That's a, that's a good word. There, there are definitely <laughs> some gruesome moments in that film uh, that are a little bit, or a lot of bit, disturbing. And, but not a lot of blood, not a lot of gore, not a lot of, you know, splattering of body parts all over the screen uh, like the like the movies that that i talked about like the uh chainsaw massacre movies you know yeah. they, that that rely on a lot of shock and awe and jump scares and this movie doesn't rely on that at all and it, you know it's not exactly a scary movie the crumbs uh it's but it's scary. not meant to be it's it, i think it's meant to be disturbing i think it's meant to that's, be like that's it disturbing yeah Disturbing and gruesome. Yeah, I, I didn't really feel like when I watched it, I didn't really feel like it really fit very comfortably in the horror category. But you know, where else are you going to put it? Uh, because these characters are weird and they're sinister, but they're also kind of fun. You know, they're kind of <laughs> they're kind of interesting and cool. And uh, so you know, horror. And it's got a it's got a good sense of humor to it, you know. It, the the movie doesn't take itself so seriously that you can't have fun watching it, you know. So, yeah. and, and I think that that's really important for a movie like this uh, that uh, that it doesn't take itself too seriously because uh, it, it can it can veer into the melodramatic, and you know you can lose your audience that way. They can be all like, uh, yeah. This isn't my cup of tea. Turn well, it off. You've got Anton's character, who's um, just that big teddy bear. You know, he's 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 that lovable person, but don't piss him off. Yeah. It's you know? that big lovable teddy bear that'll tear your head off. And then you've got Chelsea, who's playing. A, it's almost like an innocent child, but not so innocent. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, you've got your character who's um, kind of an uppity doctor type person. You know, I'm, you know, it does come across as I'm better than everybody else, you know. Um, yeah. And then Maria Olson, who comes in and she's still that kind of motherly, uh, like your aunt kind of character. The matriarch, but, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and y'all just, Fit together and of course David comes in and he's you know I'm going to find out who did this yeah. and then of course Craig's just a looney tune in the forest so <laughs> yeah I you know we talked about uh you know the fact that his character the the hermit in the woods or the homeless guy or whatever you call him uh he got unfortunately uh, he got left on the on the cutting room floor. He, he had more appearances in that movie. He had, uh, and his character, unfortunately, since there's there's only like two or three moments in the movie where his character is shown, uh, it kind of left 
uh, I saw in a few reviews uh, from from like you know IMDb users who leave their user reviews. I saw a few people that mentioned that character, and it's like, what's with the homeless guy? It's like, you know, we never paid that character off. He, he um, uh, he's just there, and you kind of scratch your head and go, what's that about? Uh, right. But he was actually in in more of the movie originally, and uh, I felt like. It, it would have been fun to have paid his character off in, you know, in some way. Uh, yeah. Although when I talked about that with David, he said, well, you know, you, we're not trying to pay it off. We're just trying to leave it out there as a question. Uh, we're just trying to leave it out there as like, uh, you know, an interesting my mystery uh, for the audience to wonder about. But since a few of his quick little cameos got left uh, in the editing room, I just, I, I felt like that character, it would have been fun to have seen more of him and figure out, or, or at least ask more questions about who that guy is. And uh, maybe think about whether we bring his character back in the sequel. And, uh, and maybe we'll discover, you know, who that, who that weird hermit guy is. It's just Craig. Come on. <laughs> it's just Craig. It's just Craig. He's hanging out. We accidentally got him on camera and yeah, David felt sorry right. for him. So kept just bring him in for a scene. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's a fun little movie. And um, I believe it it hit number one on uh, Amazon Prime. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, they they sent out a little uh uh, uh, I don't know what I don't know what the what the proper term is. Uh, I'll say press release for lack of a better word, but you know, it, it wasn't really a press release. But it was uh, it was a uh, just little uh, a little news uh, release, I guess. That our movie's trending number one in in horror on Amazon Prime uh, for for like a day or two, or maybe it was for a week or so. I don't know. Uh, but that was really cool. And I've seen that, you know, the movie's been, uh, you know, ticking up in the, uh, in the rankings on IMDb and it's, uh, it's gotten a lot of positive reviews from users. Uh, got a few really, really kind reviews, uh, from some bloggers and, uh, uh, seems to have been doing really well and uh, we've gotten a lot of great uh, uh great compliments on on you know the acting and and the directing and the writing and all that so yeah it's really gratifying that this little film's getting some attention uh, to be honest with you i'm kind of enjoying more of the independent films now than the the more mainstream films um yeah. I, I like the fact that you can escape in in the indie films is where it seems and you can be surprised by them it's yeah, really yeah. we're not really getting a lot of surprises from uh mainstream films especially in the horror genre you know yeah. it feels like uh it feels like a lot of those films are are just coming off of conveyor belt exactly. and, and uh you know they they kind of dress them up a little different they paint them uh, different colors but they're still the same formulas you know, being turned out over and over again. And uh, even though ours has elements of other formulas, uh, it has a unique take on those formulas. It has a unique twist on it. And, uh, and it, you know, like I was talking about earlier, it, it kind of mixes and matches from different formulas, from different, uh, you know, ideas and legends and whatnot. So, but it doesn't give you that, oh, I've seen this a million times kind of vibe, you know? Yeah, you definitely have not really seen a movie like The Crumbs before. It is, it is kind of a unique little piece, which, uh, and that's uh, hopefully what we'll get from the next feature uh, that I'm also in, Demon Fighter, uh, is, is also a different twist on the whole uh, demon possession movie 
Um, and of course they, CRA, Craig and, and David's first film was a demon possession movie. Uh, but that again was something, they, they did something really different with it. They did something really subtle with it, uh, I thought. Uh, and, and again, it wasn't like outright jump scare horror in and exactly. they didn't do the they didn't do all of the the old you know demon possession tropes that you expect you know spinning heads and you know heavy makeup and green eyes and you know vomit flying and <laughs> exactly. uh, you know and 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 like scars and cuts happening on the body out of nowhere that kind of thing you know all of those you know really scary things like you know the skin splitting open and whatnot uh that you see in in you know your standard demon possession type films uh you don't get in that you just you just see this woman turn from somebody who the family loves and trusts into somebody the family just has no idea who the hell mom is anymore and uh and and that again is more disturbing and psychological than it is scary. Uh, but I think it makes for, it makes for an interesting uh, and different kind of a film. Well, it's closer to what would really happen in real life than you know, what you usually see in the movies where it's always over exaggerated, you know, yeah. the, the pea soup and the head spinning, all that stuff. Yeah. But, I mean, I have, I've dealt with the paranormal for years and, Although uh, never uh, a possession to that that degree, but I've never seen anybody's head spin around. Or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I can tell you. Um, although I've never dealt with anything paranormal firsthand, uh, my mother uh, actually participated in uh, an exorcism. Really? Yeah, for for real. Uh, she she was actually part of. Uh, I grew up in a in a church in a, in a like I told you earlier in San Diego, but uh, the the area that we were in was a little bit more uh, suburban, almost semi rural, mm -hmm. and uh, the little church that we went to when I was growing up, uh, there was a there was a woman who came to the pastor, uh, and uh, they she had been having you know, some, some severe, you know, psychotic problems. Uh, and they determined, and I, I, I'm not sure how legit it is, <laughs> uh, but they determined that, that they believe that she was possessed. My mom said that she saw this little woman who was only about, you know, five foot nothing and a hundred pounds, uh, throw two men off of her like they had just gotten hit by a linebacker uh, wow. and two large, you know, bigger guys like, you know, myself, like six two, 200 pounds, you know, holding down a, a, a 100 pound woman and just getting thrown off like they were rag dolls. And when she spoke, uh, her voice did not sound human, according to what my mother told me. Uh, her voice didn't sound like her voice didn't sound it sounded like the voice was coming from somewhere else other than from her body and and uh, you know this preternatural strength and uh, oh and and she spoke in some foreign language I don't remember what my mom told me whether it was like Greek or Latin or something she was spewing all of this you know foreign tongue of some type uh, that they could tell was a was a, a, a cohesive language, but they didn't know what she was saying. Um, so then, yeah, that's a scary thing. But, you know, again, no pea soup, no, no, <laughs> no skin splitting, no, no skin changing different colors and whatnot. Uh, just uh, a really bizarre mm -hmm. and uh, a weird uh, and radical personality change uh, along with the inexplicable strength and voice and 
uh, you know, speaking in tongues and whatnot. Oh, yeah. So, hey, you know, I've seen crazy things. So, but the world is full of unexplainable things. I know. <laughs> Just look at my family. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, yeah, we're we're looking forward to Demon Fighter. Um, I, I haven't interviewed him yet on my show, but I have talked um, on uh, on Facebook with John Asuna. So uh, you got somebody in the martial arts there with you? Yeah, yeah, and he's a he's a legit kung fu master. That guy, yeah. and uh, he's had a pretty legit career as a uh, as a stuntman as a fight choreographer uh, and he's worked on on some top shelf movies uh the the matrix uh the new matrix uh film coming out he has a role in and did some fight choreography in that film uh and it was cool to work with him he was a good guy and he was uh uh he was he was just very cool on set very and, humble uh, man, and I th I felt like he did a great job with his role. Yeah, he's he's not your your typical, um, I guess Hollywood actor. He's he's just no, not know, at all. Hey, John, can I call you? Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. And he sit there and have a conversation, and he's just he's just all around nice guy. Yeah. And if he's got the time, he'll give it to you. That's for sure. Yeah. But, well, you know. He's he's pretty famous, you know. We'll we'll, we'll see how how his attitude uh, develops when 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 he uh, when he gets more notoriety and people start to, uh, you know, make uh, <laughs> make action figures out of him and whatnot. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to seeing your performance in that. Um, Y'all are gonna do the crumbs too. You know, that's that is. Uh, that that's something that we've brought up and and talked about and, and it really just kind of depends on the popularity of the first film how much traction it gets uh i know that david and john uh, and craig are definitely interested they've got ideas for what they'd like to do with the crumbs too and uh we've talked about it we've joked about it uh in and you know so it's uh it's 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 a possibility. It's it, I can't tell you it's a probability, but uh, I think that it is something that they are definitely interested in doing if if they feel like it's uh, uh, commercially viable. Well, I want more. I, I hope somebody and, else does. And we hear a lot of that from the fans. The fans of the crumbs are saying there's there's a lot more and there's more story to tell. I mean the uh, the one of the cool things about having a family that's that's you know semi immortal is that there's a really deep backstory. We could talk about you know how they first came to invent the formula, how you know, yeah. uh, and we could talk about how they uh, how and why they left England and came to America and and how they got from you know the the east to the western part of uh, of, of America, and, and you know what might have happened all along the way, and we could even look into you know the near future, maybe ten years down the road, and see what they're doing. Are they still running that bed and breakfast? Have they been run out of town? Are they you know maybe they're maybe they're set up in Tasmania now? You know maybe they're faking Australian accents now. Uh, you know, uh, we don't know. We, we could do. We could go a lot of different directions uh, with a sequel or or a franchise. I think, I think it makes a great premise for a television series because uh, oh, yeah. you can you can tell so much story. We can, you know, talk about uh, you know Victoria and uh, and Leonard's. You know, the the way they're friendship develops into something more and uh we can talk about you know how it was that uh and, and here's one of the other really disturbing kind of icky 
elements of the movie. Uh, we could talk about how uh, Dr. Benjamin and Irene, his mother, got together and why and, and how they justified the incest between the two to, uh, to produce Victoria. Because uh, there's a whole there's a whole backstory there that we as actors, we discussed at length, at great length. We had a very uh, well thought out, cohesive backstory and history uh, that we talked about. I, I actually took the time to write out a timeline of, you know, uh, like, 1876, Dr. Crumb tries to introduce the formula to British society and he's mocked and ridiculed and driven from the aristocracy and they have to leave England. You know, 1902, they arrive in Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of uh, detailed out this whole timeline of, of how the family started when Victoria was born when my character was born, when my father died, and and all of this, uh, and so there's a, a definitely not that anything that I and and the actor, the other actors wrote or came up with, not that any of that would would become canon in the uh, Crumbs universe, but it could. Uh, but it just goes to show you that there's you know a lot of fun and you know interesting ways to uh to develop the the story for sequels prequels or hey. you know a whole franchise hey should be on netflix exactly it would be a, it would be a great netflix show well i want to thank you for taking time out of your day and uh and spending it with with us and we'll get to know you a little bit better and and, uh, well, I thank you for having me, man. And I, and I want to thank you for, you know, doing this podcast, inviting me and, and the rest of the of the uh, Crumbs family and Crumbs crew on to uh, to, you know, raise awareness about the movie and get people uh, interested in it and get some more fans uh, because movies like ours, you know, word of mouth is, is the only way we're going to grow our audience because uh, it's a real it's a real niche type of a film and so having guys like you doing what you do and uh and boosting us on your on your podcasts you know <laughs> big time help it's a big time help and we appreciate it i personally really appreciate you for for doing these podcasts and for having me on well thank you so much and we hope you enjoyed this episode of listen to the vibes you can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favourite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network and on Instagram at The Vibes Broadcast.